three to four million people that's been genocide. A five, six year old kid, I've seen little baby smash on trees because they came from an educated family. They try to kill down to the roots. Took the kid and smashed into the... Yeah, it's, it's, it's... And brutal. you saw that? I've seen everything as a kid. Shoot him in the head. I've crossed swamp and there's dead bodies and got up in the middle of the night, go steal potatoes and cook it and put it in our mouth. And the next day they line them up and they said that someone's been stealing potato. If I find out who it is, I'm gonna cut your head off. You live your life to the fullest, no matter what situation you're in. Everyone has problems. Everyone's going through things. We all do. But we can sit here and dwell on the things we can't do or we can sit here and focus on the things we can do and continue to live. So Chris, I believe you're sitting right now and thinking what the hell this guy is doing here. So he came from Lithuania, so that's 10,000 kilometers away. So he came six hours from LA to Hero to almost Sacramento. And to answer this question, which you didn't ask, I'm gonna tell you a short story, if you will. Oh, yes. In 2000, so I started uh, working out, going to uh, the gym in 2000, I believe seven, maybe 2008. And I was, I became a, a big fan. So I followed everyone. So that was Ronnie, Jay Cutler, and a lot of all those guys, old school guys, Sky Green, Phil Heath, all those celebrities. I was working out, I was eating right, I was going to the gym and I loved it. So I was consuming a lot of information, I was watching a lot of videos, but that was 2008, 2009, 2010, so Facebook was not as, as it is right now, so YouTube was not as it is right now, so there was, wasn't that much of videos, etc. In 2014, in 2014, my mom, because of alcohol, got to, into a coma. And that was the day and that was the time when I did one thing. I'm going to show you one photo. It says one thing on, on my t-shirt. and It says in Lithuanian language and I'm going to translate it what it means in, uh, in English. So that's me, as you can see, 2014. So it says, my mom is going to get well. So I made these t-shirts for me, for my wife, for my... Um, for my dad. You know why? Because in 2014, I would believe I was following you for two or three years. And I remember just like yesterday, I remember your on, almost every post on Facebook was, I one day I will walk again. And you know what you did? You, you, you gave me such an inspiration and the hope that my mom is going to get better because I saw you as a as an example almost four years later my mom didn't didn't wake up she was in a coma and she died and after all those years I still remember you and I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for giving me this hope for those four years that my mom is going to get well I really appreciate it Chris yeah, no, thank, no, thank you. Because to me, hope is all you have. And, you know, it doesn't matter what situation you're in. Sometimes, you know, God puts you in situations and, you know, circumstances and events to where, you know, you're going to get something out of it. Everybody gets something out of something, right? So I always believed that, you know, to me, it's like, if I can help that one person, you know, um, get their level of life better in some shape or form, then I feel like I did my job. To me, I think there's a, everyone's got a purpose here. I really, really believe everyone's got a purpose on this earth and you have to live up to your purpose. Now, I would love to walk again, but maybe it's not my time, you know, and I see all the, all the things that are coming up, 
the new technology with the brain and with the uh, Bluetooth from the brain where it can, you know, move your whole legs and everything. But I believe one day I will walk, but it's not my time, it's God's time. And that's how I look at it. Uh, I just continue to push forward and do everything I can to try to live a better life, no matter what situation I'm in. Um, whatever's thrown at me, I take it on, dead on. It's like, you know what, I'll take you on, I'll mm -hmm. take you on, whatever it is. Just like what I was telling you, you know, uh, I'm on Dallas, is five day a week right now, you know? And it takes that one third of my day. So I have to make the other two thirds of my day as effective as yeah. I can, you know? But if I'm still on this earth, there's a reason why. And I live with gratitude every day. Gratitude for my wife, gratitude for my kids, gratitude that I still have a roof over my head. And I do my gratitude every morning and every night, 10 to 15 things that we don't even think about as easy as I'm so happy and grateful to be able to see. So happy and grateful that I can work out. So happy and grateful that I can breathe, you know? I'm so happy and grateful that I can drive my car, you know? And a lot of people, they take those little things for granted, you know? But a lot of people go, oh, if I don't have money, then I'm not happy. That's not true. Happiness is a choice. You have to make it a choice every single day. For sure. Chris, what happened to you? Because I've read some stories. I've, I've read the, the Wikipedia. I want to hear from you what yeah. happened. So um, in 2007, I had aortic dissection. That's when the main artery that's connected to the heart burst. That's what uh, Einstein died from. That's what a lot of uh, people die from and they think it's a heart attack. It's not, it's the main vessel that's connected to the heart. That's what burst. And I had a 10% chance to live. They gave me 10% chance that I'll live. And if I did, I was gonna wake up with brain damage and paralysis. And miraculously, I got up and um, walked at point A to point B, I was out of breath. Um, I started getting on the treadmill, walking, and then slowly walking faster, and then get to the point where I was able to run again, mm -hmm. start picking up a three pound weight, and then it went to a five pound, then a 15, and miraculously, six months later, muscle memory came back and I gained everything back. So I didn't want to end my career like that. I wanted to end it on my term, not because of something happening to me. So in 2009, I decided to come back and do um, another bodybuilding competition. Yeah, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, but at that point you were already pro? You were competing? I, I turned pro back at 2003. Three. You yes. were competing in Mr. Olympia, uh, Arnold in 2004, Classic. Yeah, uh, I competed in yeah the Mr. Olympia. Uh, and you were huge. How how big were you were? Uh, five six, five seven. Uh, most I would weigh is about two thirty five, two forty with abs. Lean, lean, yeah, yeah. Lean. And then, uh, but on stage, my best weight is about two o five. I tried two fifteen, two seventeen. I tried to play the size game. Yeah, it didn't work for me. I started getting kind of bulky looking, yeah. aesthetically pleasing. Um, two o five. Uh, you were shredded. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, I came back, I decided to do another competition and, and everybody thought I was crazy. <laughs> they saw my name on the roster and they said, you know, what, what is Dem doing to himself? And um, I got on stage, took top three back then and qualified for uh, my uh, third Mr. Olympia. And so um, then in 2009, I decided to retire, that was it. And in 2012, um, I was uh, uh, just uh, training clients and doing what I was doing, and I felt a thousand pound on my chest again, and I knew what it was, so I drove myself to the hospital. Wow. And so I got to the first hospital, and I said, you know what? If I go in, I'm gonna die because they don't have a good cardiologist. So then I decided to, sell, to drive myself to another hospital. <laughs> How did you do that? Uh, I just, you know, I have a high pain thrust. I still do now. So I went in and my blood pressure was 240 over 180. You're talking about hypertension, heart attack. 
and so they rushed me in right away, took me in, and um, all I remember was I woke up and they had me in this ice suit and I was freezing cold. And um, I said, you know, after two days later, I said, please take this off, please take this off, because I was freezing. They kept you for two days in an ice, ice suit. suit. Because they're, I didn't know what it was at the time, but they were trying to preserve my spinal cord. So, and um, you know, the doctor, I had a really good relationship with him. He came to me two days later and he just got back from a trip to New York and he went down there because he's uh, uh, one of the best doctor in the world as when it comes to aortas and so forth. And so he was in a, uh, a seminar with all of these doctors and he looked up on the screen and there it was, athletes and uh, aorta. I was on the big screen and they're talking about it and he said he came back and he, you know, and he didn't get no sleep for two days and came back and he was looked like he was in tears. He says, you know, Chris, I don't know what happened. I did everything I could. And um, you have a spinal cord injury. He said, there's a chance you'll never walk again. And I tried to take my first step and I just dropped and I couldn't feel my legs, couldn't move my toes. And I said, this is real. And I told the doctor, I said, you know, if this is the only thing and you saved my life, I want to thank you. You know, I said, I'll, I'll get through this. And that's when I, the adventure began, really. I mean, it was just one thing to the next. And, you know, and uh, 10 years later, 2019, I decided to come back and do a wheelchair and bodybuilding competition. Why? Because I was getting depressed, I was getting, you know, sad, down, I was getting a gut, and I knew I needed to do something to change my life. You needed to go? I needed to challenge myself and get better in all aspects of my life. So I decided to come back and do a wheelchair bodybuilding competition, and I did the two biggest show on the planet, which is uh, the Arnold Classic and the Wheelchair Mr. Olympia. And I took second at the Arnold Classic, third at the Wheelchair Mr. Olympia, and not after competing for 10 years, that mm. is. So I can honestly tell you that was the most challenging things that I've ever done because, you know, when you have no brace on your legs and you try to get into these machines or you try to, you know, you have, you have no balance, nothing. And, um, my wife was like my leg. She's the one that was taking the weight off for me, putting the weight on for me, or else I would have to get off and on all the time. And um, she was my spotter, and, and I did it. And, but I'm glad I did it, and I retired right after that because I did it just to challenge myself, and I wanted to prove to other people that, look, no matter what trial and tribulation that you're going through, you're stronger than you think, and you can get through anything. Is that more mental or physical game? Both. Both. But of course it's mental because you got to be able to get through it. Um, you know, because if your mental aspect is strong, you can do anything and everything. Because when your body gives out, what's going to keep you going is the mental of your brain to keep pushing. And, you know, when you hit the pain thrust, that's when I tell myself, that's when, that's when you're seeing results. So no matter what it is in life that you're doing, you know, you gotta be able to hit the paint thrust. I don't know what about you guys, but when the summer starts, I love running. I like running. And every summer I try to run half a marathon. And you know, sometimes there are days when you just have to have that energy. The coffee doesn't kick in. I don't want to go into energy drinks and I have to find something that will give me endurance and that will give me of course energy so this product pre-caged sport pre-workout is created specifically for other sports not for bodybuilding not for fitness it is created for 
football, which is created for basketball, for running, for tennis, for badminton, for volleyball, for, for every physical activity. It has natural caffeine, it's very important. It's not synthetic. It has beta alanine, it has magnesium, it has B vitamins. So this will give you energy and you won't get those pumps, those muscle pumps, which you used to have when you go for a workout at the gym. Because when you play soccer, when you play football, when you play basketball, when you go for a run, you don't need that kind of pump, right? So this product is specifically created for us guys and gals. Just go to cage.com, use discount code Apollo, A-P-O-L-L-O, -L -L and you will get 15% additional off every product on that website. What is very important to me is that these products, all cage products are naturally flavored. They don't have any synthetic BS. For example, this has only natural caffeine. This is crucial for you getting that real energy, not the one that you get from energy drinks when you go to the top after 30 minutes and then you go down straight to the hell when you're fatigued and you've got no energy at all. So go to cage.com. Don't forget discount code Apollo, A-P-O-L-L-O, -L and you will get 15% additional off all the products on that website. I can promise you, you won't be disappointed with the quality of all these products. And now let's get back to the podcast. So Chris, 2023 right now, you're on dialysis. Yes. What's ha what happened once again? So um, I, uh, when I had my spinal cord injury, I was self-calfing, you know, as far as uh, to pee. And um, sometimes it would get inflamed. Sometimes I wasn't able to self calf so I wasn't able to pee. And um, it backed up my kidney. Yeah. So it lasts for a decade? No. Um, well, it didn't affect me until obviously the right last, now. you know, yeah, year. Um, so you're waiting for a transplant. Um, we're trying to get a transplant. The problem is, is when you, uh, when you have a catheter, you're really prone to UTI bladder infection. Yeah. And if you have a bladder infection, it could travel up back up to your heart and it can kill you. So, um, what I'm hoping for is, uh, you know, basically, uh, someone will, you know, allow it and, and overturn it, you know. So I, you know, I just believe there's hope. And um, meanwhile, I'm, I have to continue to keep living my life and not letting it get to me and just look at it as part of life right now. And you move on. You know, I'm not going to sit here and dwell on it. Now, if I ever did, no one would ever complain about it. But to me, it's like, you know, everyone's got problems. Someone's problem might be bigger than the other, but as long as it's your problem, you're going to have to f figure out a way to deal with it, right? And most people, they let life stop them when things happen to them. They just stop doing everything and anything. And to me, it's like, no, you push even harder. Where did this mentality uh, occur? Um, because I came down from Cambodia from the killing field at the time. And uh, that's when the Khmer Rouge took over. It's like communists. And they uh, basically, uh, there was about, they can't estimate between three to four million people that's been genocide. And um, so we uh, escaped there and we went to Thailand to a refugee camp. Mm -hmm. And my uncle's sponsors have brought us to the United States. But as a kid, I mean, uh, a five, six year old kid, I've seen little baby smash on trees because they came from an educated family. They try to kill down to the roots. They don't want anybody who's got any type of education because they might raise up in power. Smashing kids into Everything. a tree? I mean, you name it, they've done it. Shoot them in the head. I mean, anything that they just has... took the kid and smashed into the yeah, it's, it's, it's. Brutal. And you saw that? I've seen everything as a kid, crossing the swamp. And I mean, I got leech bite to today that's still on my, my legs and stuff from being, you know, young. And um, I've crossed swamp and there's dead bodies. And, you know, uh, when, you know, the, the shooting took place, we would dig in a hole so we wouldn't get shot, you know, underneath, you know. And that was you 
your siblings and your mom mm -hmm. yeah your dad was uh... dad so it was like an ant colony everybody kind of scattered when the come up command reach took over and um dad went one direction mom and the kids and my grandma um went another direction <clears throat> and um that's um that's what happened and then all said and done 16 17 years later um my someone told my mom about my dad but you know they've already had different lives and you know remarry and everything yeah. else and his last wish was he wanted to see me before he passed away so me not really knowing the language because i'm from here really yeah. you know i went down there um because he wanted to see me before he passed away he had a stroke and so i flew down there to you cambodia know, yeah to cambodia my oldest brother was still there because my mom was trying to sponsor and get him back here I mean, that's in the story itself, but um, so I was with my brother and then come to find out because I was sending their family money because they're saying that, hey, you know, my your dad needs medical help. You know, can you help? So I was sending money every month and not even paying attention. Well, come to find out when I got there, he already passed away. They're just trying to get money out of me. So I was pretty disappointed. Imagine not seeing your dad your whole life and next thing you know, you, there's like empty feeling, you know, because I played sport my whole entire life here in the United States and, um, you know, soccer, football, basketball, you know, you name it. And, and so their dad's always there and I was the only one that didn't have a dad, yeah. you know. So, so I, had a, I grew up really early and really fast and so I tried to be there for my kids, you know. Do you remember Cambodia before <clears throat> this revolution? How was it? No, I was, I was so little. Yeah, I don't didn't remember. Much. You just remember the horror. I remember the horror because I mean that's that's what we remember as a kid. You know, no matter what, you know, yeah. we always remember all the bad things that happened. And when I came to the states, we uh, we lived with a Caucasian family, you know, because they sponsor us, and I had to learn the language. And I was already seven, about seven. I had to learn the language. I had to learn how to live here and everything else and we uh we we made the best of it so tough times create tough people oh yeah exactly so because of that <clears throat> i never wanted to disappoint my mom because she brought us here and you know she used to work for the the khmer rouge or they actually used her as slave pretty much and um she said you know she would I remember her putting food in her mouth in the middle of the night because we're starving. We didn't have any meat or nothing. They just gave us rice pear, uh, broth, really. And, um, you know, she would got up in the middle of the night, go steal potatoes and cook it and put it in her mouth. And the next day they lined them up and they said that someone's been stealing potato. If I find out who it is, I'm going to cut your head off. And so mom, being that she wants to take care of her kids was really willing to sacrifice her life just so we can eat so ever since then you know coming to the states I never want to disappoint my mom you know whatever I can do to help I feel you know I'm gonna try to help you know do you know right now a lot of people say that because of something that happened in their childhood let's not take the war the soldiers but even the kids, even, even right now, grown-ups have PTSD. I did for a little bit because my mom met another guy when he's she, when we were at the refugee camp, and um, we we're staying in the refugee camp, and some robber came in and took his uh, boombox, his radio, and he ran out after them, and all I heard is pow. pow. And they all went out looking for him, and I happened to be going the other way, and I was the first person that saw him on the floor dead. So the I'm thief or the guy that got after him? My my stepdad. Yeah, and so that messed with me until I was probably about 21. And anytime there's a drizzle rain, it would give me flashback of what happened. Because that, that day was raining. That day was a drizzle rain. And so I would always see it and I would have to drive and get into the house because I was just, you know. Panicking? Yeah. Panic attacks? Yeah, yeah. How did you get rid of it? I just started accepting it. 
start accepting it and just uh, realize that that's uh, life and you just deal with it. How do you view life and death right now, seeing so many deaths and so, so much horror from your childhood? You know, um, I look at it because I've been through it with a 10% chance to live and I've had two cracked in my chest surgery. They did a stent and the third one is full cut all the way across and that's what caused a spinal cord injury. Um, life is very touchy. You could be here one moment, you could be gone the next moment. So you try to live your life to the fullest and not let things get to you as much. You know, you just uh, realize that when you go from a 10% chance to live and everything that I've gone through, I try to live the best of life and do what I can and, and not sit here and stressed out and complain and do things that that really doesn't really mean much, you know? Chris, what was that tipping point when you when you realized you're, you're not going to walk at least for, uh, for some time? What was the tipping point that you realized you have to switch, you have to change your mindset and you have to live, live on? Yeah. Well, you, you have to try to continue to live life no matter what you're going through. But you can still have that hope like we talked about, you know, um, that I would walk again, you know. But at the same time, you have to be able to continue to keep living. You can't sit here and go, I'm not walking, I'm not walking, I'm not walking. And next thing you know, you're going to let life get to you where you have to take control of your life and say, you know what, this is my situation, but I'm not going to let this stop me from continuing to move on and do what I need to do on this earth. So before we started uh, filming, you said that you believe every human being on, on the planet Earth has a purpose. Did you find out yours? You know, um, I don't think we ever know what our purpose is 100%. But I know the purpose that I'm here, that's to, like I said, if I can help one person, you know, motivate them, inspire them. You got me. Then, you know, um, I did my job on this Earth. You know, so to me, it's like you live your life to the fullest, no matter what situation you're in. Everyone has problems. Everyone's going through things. We all do. But we can sit here and dwell on the things we can't do. Or we can sit here and focus on the things we can do and continue to live and uh, be in gratitude every single day. Because, like, you know, I was talking, like, I'm, every morning I do my gratitude. 10 to 15 things that I'm grateful for. And then I do it every night. Because if when you do your gratitude, no matter what situation life you're going through, it's not that bad, you know? And I think a lot of people, they, they don't, they're not thankful for the little things. It's just being able to walk, you know? Just being able that's, to, that's simple thing. Yeah, not, not to go through pain every day. Like I have 24 hour pain you know, from being cut, the nerve pain feels like stun gun and sandpaper when it still. touches my shirt, still. And so I have to learn how to deal with it, you know? And so I can sit here and dwell on my pain or I can sit here and focus on what I need to get done to continue living, right? And most people, they, they at a standstill. When something happened in their life, they just feel like everything is the end of the world. Hmm. You know, and, and, and I deal with a lot of people, even in a wheelchair, you know, they, you can tell, they it just, they just, they're miserable. You know, and it's like, I look at my life and I'm like, I'm blessed, you know, I'm blessed. I got a, a, a nice, beautiful wife that supports me in every step of the way, never complains about anything. Um, God bless you. Know, I got my kids and, 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 and like, you know, I'm still here. So it's like, you know, there's a lot to be said, you know. Uh, you know, someone always has it worse than you do. There's that saying that, you know, there's a guy who's got no, uh, no shoes, but he wasn't appreciative till he met a guy who's got no legs, yeah. right? So someone always has it worse than you do. So might as well suck it up and, and just, uh, you know, be in gratitude every single day when you wake up. Every day I wake up, I'm six feet above ground, I'm blessed. Every day. 
uh, in our family we practice this thing I believe for a year now so as you saw my son is four years old so even now since he was three three and a half we do creditors but we, we do not in the morning but we do right before bed yeah so it doesn't matter how bad or how good how good the day was we just uh, meet in the bedroom right before he gets to sleep and we thank for some some stuff yeah. like I was I've met with my friends I had some uh, delicious food, uh, I went to the pool, I, I read a book and etc. And there was times, to be honest with you, when you go into this, uh, this gratitude and you think, the day was like ordinary day, I have nothing to be thankful for. Yeah. And then you, you, my son starts, because he's the youngest, then my wife says, and I see like, yeah, there, are some, there is some stuff that I, I can be thankful for this day. And when you say this out loud, well, that was not that kind of a bad day, actually. Yeah. yeah. So I really believe, just like you, that there is nothing worse, I believe, than just uh, ungrat un uh, uh, not grateful. I always say, don't be an ungrateful pig, because mm -hmm. if you you won't be ungrateful, the universe, the God, won't get you more. Yeah. Yeah. It's whatever you believe in. I mean, whether you believe in the universe, you believe in God, you believe whatever. It's like, you know, I, I still believe there's some higher power. Um, you know, and, and at the same time, for me, it's my belief that everything happens for a reason. And as long as you continue to keep moving forward, you know, you will get yours. Everyone does. For sure. Do you believe in God? Yeah. Yeah. You're a Christian? I used to go to church all the time. Um, but before that, my mom is, a, is Buddhism. Yeah. Um, I believe in God. I, I, I don't go to church anymore, but I still believe there's only one God, you know. Um, Have you ever asked God why he puts you through all this stuff? You know, I don't ask that question. What I do is I just ask for, ask for um, strength, you know, ask for, you know, um, continue to give me courage and strength to keep on pushing and, and, uh, not be so depressed or down or whatever you know that people go through in life right yeah so um i try not to ask questions like that you know it's like you know why do you put me here why am i in this position i used to back in the day you know um, you because yeah a lot of people don't realize that we all go through it and like they see me on instagram and facebook and stuff like that and they talk to me and they're like man He's so motivating, he's so inspiring, he's so this, he's so that, but he, but they don't realize that we're all human beings. And um, every so often I break down like everyone else. But I have this saying, there's nothing wrong with having a bad moment, but just don't allow yourself to have bad days. Bad days turn into bad weeks, bad month, bad year, and it's that much harder to try to get yourself out of it. So, you know, have your uh, pity potty, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> get over it, focus on something, you know, uh, great, and just move on with your life. As simple as that. Chris, have you ever uh, wondered what was the, uh, the reason why did you have that stroke in the first place? Well, that was not the stroke, but yeah, that the aorta dissection. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, the doctor used to tell me my blood pressure is high and my cholesterol is high and it runs in my family. That's why my dad had a stroke. Mom's got high blood pressure, high cholesterol. And no matter how good you eat, it's, it, you have to take some type of medication. That's for you guys. So don't ever think that, you know, sometimes it's hereditary and you think, it, I'm, no, I don't want to take anything. If your blood pressure is off the roof, go get help. The reason why I'm saying that is because when they talk about a silent killer, um, you know, a heart attack is, is you just don't know unless you check your blood pressure on a regular basis, you're not going to know if you have a heart attack or not. And so with me, they would tell me that and I think I was invincible, you know, because I eat, I, I, I'm healthy and everything else. But um, what happened is when you, your cholesterol starts to clog up your system yeah. and your blood is trying to go through it, it's like a balloon. It keeps blowing up and eventually what's going to happen is going to burst. And so I always say, go get checked, get your blood pressure and cholesterol under control. Those are the two most important thing. And so we all think we're invincible, but when your body gives, it gives. 
So on the new generation today, I always make sure they get their blood work done. I always make sure that they check their blood pressure, they check, get their cholesterol checked out and make sure everything is healthy because you're dealing with a ticking time bomb. Yeah. You know, you never know when it's going to happen. And if I would have known what I know now, I would have taken some type of blood pressure and some type of uh, cholesterol medication. And um, I would have, I would have always monitored on a regular basis. So you've mentioned you've got uh, high cholesterol and high blood pressure from your family. But if you sp we speak frankly right here, so in addition to that, the steroids, the drugs, they do the same thing, right? They kind of up the cholesterol. It, 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 it can. Yeah, it can. And I'm not going to sugarcoat it, you know, from mm -hmm. the past. Um, did it probably accelerate it? Probably. But it was already high to begin with, you know, with, with my parents, you know. Um, even though I ate super, super clean and everything, you know, it's just that in life sometimes you have to be extra careful and um you know we sometimes we take it for granted you know just like you said but we think we're invincible yep something something bad happens to the to our neighbor to someone else on, on yeah it's on, not on happening to me on YouTube, right not, not it's not gonna happen to me and yeah one, yeah one day just like this yep that's the same what happened to my mom so she was uh she was kind of an alcoholic she would drink 25 years we never thought that, that this could happen and one day she just didn't wake up and uh, the blood vessel bursted in her brain, and that's it, she's, she's done. She, she was almost four years in a coma, and done. She was yeah. only 53, she, she was 49 when she got there. Yeah, my dad died at 54. That's way too young. Yeah. See, Life yeah. only starts at this age. Yeah, Your kids I mean, are being I'm, raised. I'm 50, so, you know, so you're talking about taking care of myself and doing everything I should be doing now, but, you know, is it a little late? never too late but could have been a different outcome absolutely yeah. so Chris in the last few years we, we see the tendency of young bodybuilders just dying what do you think is the reason I think the new generation I'm not speaking to all of them I'm speaking for most of them yeah they rely on the drugs and they're not putting in the hard work and they think that they they take more stuff they're gonna get bigger yeah where with my athletes i push them hard like i make sure the workout is pushed to the limit first and the eating is on track so those are the two most important things and a lot of the new generations they don't think like that like i said i'm not speaking to all, about yeah. all of them but and then at the same time they are playing russian roulette because they don't want to go get their blood work done they, they just lazy because they, they don't, don't want to see the bad they results. Know. They don't want to know the outcome. So, 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 so in this sport, it's not the lineal result. What I mean is, if you get more dosages, the, the, the more steroids you do, it doesn't mean you get the better results. Absolutely not. So, no. if you 10x the dosage, the probability That's, of getting better results yeah, is and, and, and then you got to keep taking more and more and more because yeah. your receptor gets used to it. Then you got to keep upping your dosage even more. You know, where if you would, you know, really change your eating, shock your system, shock your training, shock everything, then your body's going to work at a different level, you know. Yeah. But I think a lot of people, they think more is better because, you know, it's just uh, psychologically, right? Well, just that's just the general public, right? Yeah. And they go bridging. They don't do yeah. uh, off seasons, right? Well, yeah. So a lot of time they stay on, they never even come off. And so to me, I don't believe in doing that. And you can do any, anything the safest way. You can, you really can. Why do you think they have anti-aging clinic? So they can check, check your level, everything, right? Yes. yes. So, and they do it the safest way possible. So you can do anything the safest way, but you can also do it and abuse anything, right? No matter what it is. So, you know, um, and I always tell a lot of the guys that if you're not planning on competing and getting to the level of the, the pro and Mr. Olympia and so forth, why, why touch it? Why mess up your hormone? Why mess up your testosterone? Because once you're on it, your test, and you come off, your testosterone level is gonna be super low. Yeah. You know? You're gonna stimulate your uh, yeah. testicles to, to do the natural stuff. Mm -hmm. Let's take the pro level, uh, percentage wise. So we got th three points. We've got drugs, which is steroids, we've got uh, food, and we've got training. 
So percentage wise, how important are those three things? The eating is going to be, the eating is going to be 75, 80% in my wow. opinion. Wow. And a oh, lot of 100%. people, a lot of people don't understand that. On the pro level. Yeah. It's always the eating because if you don't get your meals in, then how are you going to grow? It doesn't matter how much, how much. It doesn't matter. You, take. you know, okay. you know, Ronnie says, I can give you all the drugs in the world. Hmm. You'll never look like me. Well, he's genetic. She's, he's a genetic monster. He's yeah, but it's, it's also true, though, you know, because a lot of people think, oh, you know, I used to own a uh, Max Muscle Nutrition store. And I used to have the guys that used to come into my place. I'm on this, I'm on this, I'm on this, I'm on this. And they look like they're like a toothpick, like this, you know. And, and so it, it just amazes me. These guys, you know, they come in and they, they don't understand. Like, it's, everything's reverse. You know, steroid is just the... It's just uh, uh, what I call uh, a little uh, uh, a little thing that's gonna help you kind of like give you a boost, but that's not the whole thing. It's your eating and your training, your sleep, your over-the-counter supplements, everything. You got to get your body working at it at you know the level that it needs to be, and then when you do this, it's a little bonus. That's all it is. Well, that's not a little one. You can't say that that's a little one bonus because uh, when, what we see on the stage and what a person can achieve naturally, that's two different pe persons, right? Yeah, I know. But you have to understand that if you're not eating right, yeah, you're not doing you're gonna look like look, look at Jay. Jay used to do eight to ten meals a day. Wow. And, and I used to do, day. when I was at my level, I used to do eight meals, eight to nine meals a day. And, and you was, were sleeping what, six hours? I was sleeping six hours and I was taking a nap in the middle of the day. Okay, gotcha. And so, um, but you talking about protein wise, I was taking in 12 ounces of protein per meal, eight to nine meals a day. And I was doing a protein shake after workout. I mean, I, eating was like full time for us. Do you think that was too much back then or no? For protein? protein? I mean, you, if, if you want to grow, you got to get your protein in. You have to. You know, you don't have you don't have any other options. You know, yeah. I mean, Ronnie was just at a different level because when I did the European tour with him, yeah. every time he turned around, I was eating. He's like <laughs> eating again, eating again. I'm like, yeah, man, I'm not I'm not like you, man. You know, I hardly sit and eat, but of course I know he eats. But I was constantly eating. You know, because you know, Asian guy isn't supposed to be that big. Yeah. And when I was competing, there was no Asian guys. Yeah. I was the only one, and so. Um, I knew my genetics and I knew that I'm small bone and I knew that I had to keep up with my food if I wanted to grow, you know. So right now if we, we see, we watch uh, this area that you were mentioning is uh, Ronnie, Jay. So Jay looks amazing. He's, he turned 50 a yeah, few days ago, just I believe. 50, yeah. He looks amazing. He yeah. looks, he yeah. looks way younger than he used to uh, look when he was competing because he looks amazing. On the other side, Ronnie, Ronnie yeah. doesn't look good. Do you yeah. think that came from that hard, hard training he you, did? You know, if Ronnie to do it again, he'll do it the same thing. He already said, you know, but multiple times, but it really with him was just had to do with his back surgery and, and they just, the doctor jacked up his back and then what happened was he didn't let it heal completely. And he, he came back and he tried to do it again. And he jacked it up even more. And then all said and done, I think Ronnie's got like 14 surgery or something, you know? Yeah, something like this. So, you know, um, that was his thing. But, you know, he worked out with, uh, you know, Arno the other day and the video that he showed working with Arno, he, yeah. looks, he looks great, he's starting to look good again, you know? So, um, but with him, it was just the surgery. It was, that's what jacked him up. But Ronnie is such a phenomenon, he was, big, huge, muscular, veiny, and strong. He had so much strength in his legs and, and in, in his hands. That's incredible. So tell me about you getting the pro card. Was that easy? And how no, much? No, because I wasn't like everyone else. It, I wasn't like a, a Phil Heath. Four years, next thing you know, he's getting on the Mr. Olympia yeah. stage. It took me 16 years to turn pro. Wow. So of uh, perseverance and in that 16 years the most days I've ever taken off was one or two days over the weekend. 
So I was, uh, I had a chip on my shoulder because when I told people I was going to be a bodybuilder, they laughed at me because my freshman year in high school, which is ninth grade, yeah. um, I, uh, I was 98 pounds, you know? 98 pounds, 40 98 kilos. 98 pounds, yeah, yeah. You were playing football? I, I, uh, I was wrestling at the time, yeah. What division is that? What class? Uh, uh, wrestling, I, my freshman year, I actually got to the point where I actually rushed to varsity. So I got really good and um, I wrestled 98 pounds. Wow. And, um, you know, that was my freshman year. And um, every year I put on about five to seven pounds. Every year, five to seven pounds. And I just stayed consistent on the course. And I did my first show when I was 17. I started training when I was 14. And um, I think I was like 130 pounds, you know. And I took home um, the teenage division first place uh, overall in best poser. And then I was hooked right after that. And then I just stayed on the course, you know. And, and I, like I said, I had a chip on my shoulder because when I told people I was going to be a bodybuilder, they laughed at me. That were your friends? Yeah, well, everyone laughed at me. Family, friends, because you can count bones coming off of me, you know? <laughs> yeah. And so no one's going to believe that, right? Yeah. But to me, I, I, you know, if you ever see that, that picture, uh, in the mirror, the the cat looked at himself in the mirror and see himself as a lion. lion. That was me. I was a skinny kid, but I didn't care about the naysayer. I just continued to work. And uh, even though I was a hard gainer, and it took yeah. me 16 years, um, but when I did turn pro four months later, I was on the Mr. Olympia stage. Yeah. You know, so the thing about it is like, sometimes success works the exact same way. You know, you can push and push and push and nothing happened. You keep pushing, nothing happened. And then when you do hit it, you hit success, you know. Um, so when people see me, all of a sudden they see me in all the magazines, they're like, oh, look at this guy, right? But they didn't realize all the hard work it took me to get there, right? So a lot of people, when they see people that are extremely successful, they're millionaires and billionaires, they, they look at them, they think they did it overnight. They yeah. didn't know what they see, what they had to go through to get there like you know elon musk sleeping in his office and you know staying there and working you know still yeah and she still 50, does it you know 50 plus years so so the thing about it is like you know the work ethic that you have to put into and in anything you want in life you're gonna have to be consistent with it you know i always say persistent and consistent it will always get you what you want where do you think you would end up if uh, this thing never happened with your heart um so my best placing was 12th at the Mr. Olympia. Uh, means there's only 11 guys on the planet that beat me. Yeah. And that back then they didn't have any 212. Yeah. They didn't have any. That's what I was. You know, they didn't have any classic physique. They didn't have any of those things. You know, so I had to compete with guys like Ronnie who outweighs him by 100 pounds, right? Ronnie. And even like, and when I competed in um, Europe and competing against guys like Marcus Rule who, you know, outweighs Huge. me by another, you know, 60, 70 pounds and beating him, you know. So it's like, you know, you have to play your game and your strength. And I always say that, you know, don't try to play everyone else's game because I did that and yeah. it didn't work. So everyone's got their own strength that they have. They just have to play into their strength and anything they want to do in life. You would get down to, to 12, you believe? Oh, yeah. Yeah, because I was already there. I'm already competing at, you know, 205. So you'd be competing with Flex? Yeah. So Flex is actually one of my good friends. Like we, he knew, I knew him when he was a teenager coming and training with Milos. Really? Yeah. Yeah. And I see this kid, I go, man, who's this kid's got big legs, right? And his upper body at the time, you know, hasn't caught up yet, you know? Yet. Yeah. Right at, now. at the time, you yeah. know, but um, yeah, we've been friends for, you know, for a long time, you know. When did you realize you want to go pro? You know what? I took it one step at a time. You so know? at 17, you won that championship? Yeah. And then at 19, I won the Natural Universe, Open Miss Universe, the, the, the men's division. That was still natural or you? All, all natural. All natural. You know? And then at 21, still all natural. I won the Mr. California. And then it took me from 21 all the way until I was 30 to turn pro. 30 years? Yeah. So all said and done. 21 then i took a couple of years off came back and did the Mitsu usa show took six. Oh yeah and so you said you started at 14 so that's 16 yeah. years like yeah, you mentioned 16 yeah. Years, yeah 
but then I, I just stayed on the course, stayed on the course, stayed on the course, and then I won. Um, so they told me to stay in the middleweight class at the time. They said, this is a good weight class for you. You need to stay here. You can turn pro here. But I was keep putting on muscle. So I'm like, yeah. you know what? If I want to compete with the big boys, I can't win as a middleweight. I can't do well as a pro. Yeah. Just let it take its course, you know? And I just uh, stayed on the course. And next thing you know, I won the Miss USA show at uh, 2002. And then took second at the, that year at the national. The following year, I took second at the USA show. And then won the national and got my pro card. And then four months later, competed my first pro show and qualified for the Olympia. Olympia, yeah. So was that a hard decision to go on the dark side? You know what? I never looked at it that way. I looked at it as just part of the process. But I'd never been one of those persons back when I was competing at that level who abused anything. I just never believe in abusing anything. I believe in hard work, hard at you know, put in the work, and just get your meals in, do what you need to do. You when know? you got all this checked, then you go with some uh, additional help. Which yeah. Is so I mean, I didn't start doing things until I was already 26. You know, so it was like, um, but like I said, I, I never really abused it. I just you know, just a little bit, like a cocktail, and that was it. Because I know that if I put in the work, it's going gonna, it's gonna to pay itself. So a lot of people want things to happen overnight. Yeah. And bodybuilding doesn't happen like that. In bodybuilding, it's muscle density, muscle maturity takes time. Decades. Takes time. You can't go in two years later and just be a freak. Even if you did, you're never going to have the detail of someone who's been doing it for 12, 15 years. Yes. You know, it's just not going to happen. So those of you guys that are out there, just let it take its course. You know, bodybuilding is, is, a, is a marathon. It's not a sprint, you know, and you're competing with one person. That's you first, you know, and I always tell all my athletes, as long as we're getting better every time, then we did our job, you know. Now, if you went the opposite, then no, that's, you know, it doesn't work like that, you know, because then you're not growing, right? So to me in life, it's like you're, you're either growing or you're dying. It's like a flower, right? So you have to continue to grow. You see why I concentrate that much on, on, on drugs and steroids? Because I, I personally know a few guys back in Lithuania that were training like maybe for a year, max two years. And they were like watching those videos on YouTube. They were watching those magazines. They were like, I've been drinking this protein shake. I didn't get that big as this guy. So what does he take? And someone s s says, well, this guy takes this, this and that. Oh, really? So and they you know what's so way. funny is that People speculate, you know, and they don't even know. I suddenly now, oh, you know, he's got to be doing this much and that much and this and that. And, and that was the same thing with me when I was competing. It was like, you know, and, and like Lee, Lee Priest, another one. He doesn't take much either, yeah. you know. So I know that for sure because Lee and I, you know, we, we know each other for a while. But what I'm saying is that a lot of people speculate. When I was at my biggest, you know, um, wearing three and four X's shirt, you know, People would be like, Chris is this and Chris is that. And one day, one dude was at the gym and he was talking all kind of saying how much I take and this and that. And he happened to be taking, talking to one of my good friends. He didn't know. Yeah. He goes, hey, really? He goes, do you know him personally? He goes, no, well, this is what I heard. This is this and this and this. He goes, before you open up your mouth, you should know what you're talking about. Yeah. Because he's one of my good friends and know him personally. And the guy didn't say anything. So in regards to that, do you think that it should be better if pros would speak openly about this? That you they know, take? It's, 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 you know, all, because you knows. gotta remember it, that that's a subject that nobody wants to talk about. And the reason why is because, you know, that that's personable. You know what I mean? It's, it's kind of like your personal life and your personal house and your family and stuff like that. Right. Yeah. No one wants to talk about it openly. Right. So, you know, it's just one of those deals that everyone knows that people are doing it, especially in, in the pro rank. Everyone's yeah. doing it. Of course. But not just in bodybuilding. Yeah. In yeah. all the sports. Yeah. So, so it's, it's kind of like one of the Olympic coach was talking about. If they're not cheating, they're not trying. Right. <laughs> so so you're going to want to do your best. You're going to want to look your best. You're going to do everything and anything you can. Right. But it's just one of those things that no one is ever going to come out. Not everybody is going to come out openly. There might be a few guys. But for the most part, they're not going to talk about it, you know, and, and, and like, like 
even like people see me right now and on my Instagram, they're like, oh, Chris is taking shit and this and that. And I promise you, I swear my mom, I'm not touching anything because I'm on dialysis. I can't, I can't you, you do anything. Can. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, I mean, I get blood work done every month. So I got to make sure everything is on the level where it should be, you know? So I'm not going to want to ruin my life. So, you know, but at the same time, I have to rely on my diet, have to work out, I have to be consistent. So that way, you know, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm still keeping consistency. Well, the first guy that came out uh, speaking about this openly, I believe, was Rich Piana, right? Yeah. So he was speaking that why he became so popular because yeah. he was speaking frankly about all that stuff. And he yeah. was, and he's uh, one of the biggest message, I believe, was do not take it if you're not pro. If you take it, don't go hardcore. Yeah. We, we the guys that are, you believe, are that big, they don't take that much. Yeah. Because the pros take much less than the guys that are amateurs. Yeah, everybody speculates, you know, and at the same time, like, to me, you know, you have to, that's why I always tell all, everybody that be safe. Be safe about it. Get your blood work done. Get your blood Before? pressure check. Now. No, for instance, a young guy, say he's 25, he, he wants to become a pro, or maybe he wants to be the biggest in his neighborhood. So he strongly decided to go to, to do steroids. So before he does that, he needs to go do his blood work. And according to the results... Well, no, I mean, if you're doing it is when you want to get your blood work done. You know, if you're not doing it, then obviously, you know, you're fine, right? But check your blood pressure still, you know, because your blood pressure, you know, you don't... You don't have to be on it. If your blood pressure shoots up skyrocket, you can have a heart attack, yeah. right? But I'm talking about people that are cycling. If they're doing a cycle, then you know, give their body two, three weeks because it's gonna be off. Yeah. And then go get the blood work done to see of where all the level is at. So that way you can you can fix it. You know. What's the most uh, dangerous thing out there? Tren, insulin, GH. Combination of these three. You know. I have never been able to do trend because my blood pressure shoots off the roof yeah. and my, my attitude really fast. So I, I, I don't touch it. But some people, they love it and it responds well in their body, but it's very toxic. Very toxic. Trend is very toxic. So, um, you know, I don't really think. And insulin, if you don't know what the hell you're doing, don't touch it. You know, unless you know somebody who's done it and can assist you on helping you, like someone like Milos. Milos is a, a insulin king. <laughs> you know, he knows his stuff and he can get it down to the T. Yeah, know? that's precise. Yeah. That should be precise. Yeah, like how much uh, IU versus how much carbs, simple carb, complex carbs, everything. And he won't, he'll say it, he won't touch anything but fast acting. Something that you can gauge in 15 minutes. Yeah. He never... You know, some of these guys that are playing with insulin, they're playing with long acting stuff, you know, three hours, six hours, 12 hours, 24 hours. And, you know, those you're playing with Russian roulette because they go can get in a sugar well, because, coma. you know, you go through you go through an insulin shock at any time. And if you don't have some type of sugar or some type of, you know, glucose tablets or anything, you can go through an insulin shock and you can pass out or die. You gotta know what to do with with insulin because you can get into a sugar coma if no one's around, and you've taken too much. So that's uh, like mathematics, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It it could be very anabolic, you know, if it's done right. But at the same time, like if you don't know, you don't know how to do what you need to do. I don't recommend people touching it because, like I said, it could be very dangerous for you. So do you think that's uh, because of uh, GH and insulin back in the 90s? I believe Dorian was the first one that used it. Athletes became so big. So Dorian didn't them. use insulin until he got with Milos. He even, uh, he even admitted it. He goes, Milos was the one who put him on that protocol. And, that was and that's when you saw the black and white picture of Dorian. Yes. And he just looked like a freak. Freak. Okay, that's when he, he did uh, Milos insulin protocol. Wow. But the, the, the growth, I mean, yeah, you know, geez. we, it's like a kid, a little, like your son, like he, he goes through a growth spurt, right? His GH level shoots up, stable, shoots up, stable, shoots up, stable, right? So can it be bad for you? Yes, it can uh, enlarge your intestine and everything else. But if you did it in moderate dose, is it going to do that? Probably not, right? 
like anything like we talked about like moderation, moderation right? yeah so everything that you guys are doing read up on it study it learn it Be don't just hey my buddy's taking it i'm gonna take it too you should know everything about that that you're putting into your body and the safest way that you can and i'm only saying that's because some of you guys is because of family and friends and they take it you think you can take it too and like they don't even do their research you know so research anything and everything you put into your body and at this moment there is so much info you got the oh, videos yeah. you got the books you got uh, experienced guys in the gyms you got the pros that openly speak speak about it that you got so much info right now because I believe back in the, your days even 1990s early 2000s there was not that much of an info yeah but at the same time there's not a lot of like the fake stuff like they have today either you know what I mean so like back then you got all the European stuff and you got all the good stuff nowadays you know they're getting it from China, they're making it at home themselves, and then they're, they're at selling home? it. Yeah. People yeah. do that. Oh, yeah. And they inject it in their cells. Yes. Crazy. Because it's so, cheaper so, or what? Well, because that's how they're getting it. They're getting it from like China and all these countries, and what they're doing is that they learn how to make it, and then whether it be tests or whatever it is, and then then they sell it to, you know, they sell it on the black market. To the young guys, to, to the youngsters. I mean, to, guys, to right? anybody and everybody, you know what I mean? So uh, it's not just the young guys. I mean, you got older people taking it too, you know? Yeah, but if you're 30 plus and if you're 17 years old, you're going to fuck your system up worse if you're 17 years oh, old. Oh, yeah, because your body's still producing testosterone, you know? At the high levels. Yeah, yeah. So you... I just never, need to eat. I never recommend young guys doing it. And like nowadays, it's sad. I've seen some young guys that are 20, 21. They're just freaking nature on Instagram. It's yeah. just like, holy crap, you know? These guys are huge. And you know they're taking a lot of shit in a sense because they're young, you know? And they think that, you know, a lot of the time they don't really think about, they think they'll deal with the sacrifice later on, right? Yeah. But they don't realize that sometimes mm, that's, you might not have the the chance to deal with it, right? Yeah, it's not funny at all. No, nope. honestly. What do you think of TRT? Because the more and more people t talk TRT about it. TRT is still the same thing. I mean, shoot, you know. I mean, it's still you know you're 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 still taking stuff. You yeah, know? but I mean, if you're for instance 40, 45 years old, not for twenty year olds. Yeah. But yeah. if you're forty. But that's what, like I said, anti aging clinic. When you yeah. go, that's TRT, right? Yeah. You know? So. You know, they balance everything out to bring everything back to normal, right? Yes. So, Chris, you've trained with numerous pro athletes. You're a pro as well. So you've spent hours and hours in the gym. What's the most effective thing for you to do in the, in the gym if you, for instance, want to uh, get bigger? Get, so you go 10 repetitions. You go like Ben Pakulski does, MA40 program. I don't believe in one style of training. Like, you know, I have my guys doing eight, 10 reps all the way to 50 to 100 reps, you know? It burns. So, so you know, um, like Milos has a style and, 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 you know, I implement a lot of the same things, but I believe in the time and attention, the slow set. I believe in the fast twitch fiber, fast set. I believe in, you know, partial reps, full reps, um, I believe in giant set, you know, sometime, you know, like I have a uh, gym in my, my garage. So sometimes we'll do six to eight exercises for chess. And then other time we only do two at a time, you know, so we change everything up. you got to get creative. Yeah. Sets, reps, intensity, drop sets, super set, giants, everything. So if you can keep shocking your body, you get somebody who's doing eight to 10 reps and I got you doing 20 reps, you don't think you'd be sore the next day? You will. Yeah. So I believe in that shock factor for everything. That goes for eating too. Because a lot of time, I mean, like you do it for one month and after a while, your body gets used to the same eating yeah. and then you got to do something different again. You know, it could be, you know, carb cycling. It could be uh, one day keto, one day carb. It could be two day keto, one day carb. It could be, you know, too low carb, too high carb, you know, you change everything up. And then that's what I do with all my athletes is I switch everything off. So that way they can keep 
keep seeing progression. Have you ever seen good, good result on good results on keto? You know, for like let's say uh, a physique athlete, maybe or maybe like a classic when they're not big, but every bodybuilder classics are right big as they're yeah. huge. Yeah. Every bodybuilding, like I'm talking about the Mr. Olympia level, yeah. the open Mr. Olympia, you will never get everyone, anyone that's doing keto. The reason why is you need carbs to push that muscle, you know, to you get mean that for blood. the energy? Yeah, energy, but then blood flow. Blood you know? flow, yeah. Yeah. So, but let's say if I get somebody doing a bodybuilding show in their last three weeks and they just for some reason are still holding on to that last body fat, I won't put them on straight keto. But I will put them on maybe one or two day keto, one day carb. You Does know, the body uh, switches in that short? Yeah, because here's time? the thing: <clears throat> when you go five day keto and I give you a carb, it's so sensitive your body just sucks everything yeah. up, right? But if I only go one or two day keto, one day carb, your body kind of gets used to carbs still. Yeah. But at the same time, you're not gonna go to the stage where you're just, you know, your muscles just flat, flat, you know. The whole time yeah so and from all the diets that we we see right now on the market so it's paleo diet keto diet vegans uh, vegetarians uh, uh, how do they call it when they eat fish and uh, eggs mm, i forgot the name so what do you think is the most damaging to the to the body vegan you know i've 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 health tried wise, vegan too wise. i've tried vegan too and nothing against vegans but I did it for two months and um, I did everything the way I was supposed to. I got into tofu, I got into beans, I got into lentil. I was trying to keep my protein up. I even drank, uh, you know, a vegan protein yeah. shakes, which I still do. I do a plant-based protein shake because it's easier in my stomach. Yeah. But my joints started hurting after two months. I just didn't have a lot of energy and I did everything I could. You know, and it didn't work for me. I'm not saying it did. It's not like someone else could work great because I know some vegan that loves it, right? I, I just believe that as long as you're getting adequate enough of protein, fat, and carb ratio in their body, no matter what they're doing, then they're going to be healthy, right? Yeah. So, uh, but if you're eating, I think like again, these guys that have done a carnivore diet will will disagree with me. You know, but I did the carnivore diet and my cholesterol shot up the roof, you know, the red meat. But again, that's my genetic. Other people can do carnivore diet and just mm -hmm. meat diet and they do great. And they said they're healthier and everything else. You know what I mean? So it's like you got to you got to try different things and try what works for you. But don't knock it until you try it. I always say, you know, don't make fun of people who does the intermittent fasting, mm -hmm. who does, you know, uh, a vegetarian this and that. I believe that they all work, but is it going to work for you? Yeah, because we, if we watch this situation at this standpoint that you were born in Asia, so you were having fruits, vegetables, and etc. So the guys that were born thousand years, thousand years ago in Norway or in Sweden, so four seasons, they got the meat. They don't get to uh, to fruits and vegetables uh, all year round. So maybe that's why they are more carnivore and they eat more meat and they preserve the meat in the in winter just not to, to starve and to die. So they were eating nuts and, and etc. And this, the guys that were in Asia or in Africa that you had yeah, berries, food, fruits, fruit. yeah, mm -hmm. you were more used to, to carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. And you kind of, uh, your body is used to have more carbs. You digest it better, you use it better. Yeah. Yeah. You just have to play around with it, you know what I mean? And like try different things. And then you'll find something that works. You know, you'll find something that works for you. Um, I just, like I said, I'm not, I don't knock any diet. A diet is what you make of it. And what's the best diet is the one that you do and the, the one you're consistent with. <laughs> and that works. Yeah. What's the most crazy diet or the most crazy thing that you saw competing and uh, communicating with all these uh, pros? Because when I did a podcast with Alex Ardenti, he was uh, talking about the way that uh, Serge Nubre was eating, like once or twice a day only. And he was big, he had energy, yeah, yeah. he trained like a horse. Mm -hmm. And for me, for instance, if I would eat only once oh, or twice I, I would a day, yeah, I would, we would train yeah, both. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
So, so what's the craziest thing that you've heard from pros that they do? Well, I mean, I know like Dex in the off season when Dex was even at his best, Dexter Jackson. Yeah. Um, he said it would just eat one or two meals a day, and he stay shredded. So it's I think genetic it's plays a, a lot a role with it, you know. But for me, like if I don't keep up with my food, man, I I can get sick and drop ten pounds like that. Yeah. You know. And, and so, like, when I was at my peak and my best, like, I had to keep up with my food. I had to. Eating was, uh, was even, like, it wasn't even pleasurable for me. Eating was just work. For work. Me. Yeah, yeah. Because I had a, a, a weeder contract, and so when I hit the gym, it was like I, I was at work, you know? And so, uh, so a lot of people that go to the gym, they work out, and they socialize and do whatever they do. I, got, I, went, I went to the gym. I had my partner. I put on my headset and I just work. How long was uh, were your workouts? Two hours. My workout was about five, an hour, hour and a half. Not you know? not the old school like Arnold that say no, he trained for five Arnold hours. No, trained like five six hours. Is it possible? Do you believe that? Yeah, because you got to remember your body will get used to whatever you do. Five like, hours. Like here's the thing, Milos put me through the craziest workout when I had my a torn patella tendons, my kneecap, and I had surgery done. I had to get my legs to catch up, right? I did 12 leg workout in 14 days straight. Now, most people would think that's insane. insane. You, you're overtraining, right? Why did my leg grow almost two inches? Okay. Because in you were feeding with your first days. blood, with aminos? Because of the fact that I fed my body what it needs, okay? And if I'm feeding everything that my body needs, okay, what is overtraining? Overtraining just means your body has just gotten not used to it yet. Yes. Once your body gets used to it, then all of a sudden it's not overtraining anymore, right? Look at the Navy SEAL guys. They're out there. They're out there for freaking treading water for 24 hours or 36 hours or whatever it is, right? A normal person would die, right? Yeah. But they train so much that they're used to it. So to me, I don't believe in overtraining. The only way you're going to overtrain if you're not getting adequate enough of food and, okay, rest. and rest for your body, so you're going to overtrain. But if you're getting adequate enough of food, adequate enough of rest, getting all your nutrients that your body needs, right, then your body's going to recover faster, right? Yes. But if you're doing it more often, your body's going to get used to it. Ronnie trained everything twice a week. Um, you know, and then I train everything twice a week. That's how I got tighter and stay big. If I train everything once a week, I don't, I don't, I, I notice I'm not as tight. But then again, for a lot of people, they say, no, you only need one body part a week. And in Dorian styles, he only trains three, four days a week. And HAT? Yeah. Which was one set? One set, one, one main set. One main set. He Couple warm up set, and then he goes one set all out hard, heavy. You Have know? you tried it? I did. I was sore, but I, I noticed I wasn't growing. And then someone like Jay, Jay believes in high reps. I mean, a high volume, 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 you know? And I believe it works for me well, too. So like I said, don't knock until you try it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you're going to know what it is, whether it's for you or it's not for you, you know? So from what I hear about Milos, he's a psychic. He's a psycho Milos in training. Is... He knows everything. And he has some crazy you know, They call him the mind for a reason. Because when we're traveling in Europe, okay, we're in the airplane. He had a, n n shit you not, a book about that thick. And it's a doctor's book. Okay? And he's sitting there and he's highlighting. Reading, highlighting. Reading, highlighting. Wow. He wants to know everything of everything. You know? But again, not every, I mean, you ask Dexter, Dexter goes, man, I'll never train Milo. She's crazy. <laughs> you know, so, so again, but if you look at his people, the transformation, what they're able to do in six months is insane. So obviously something's working, you know? Um, so, but like I said, you got to see what works for you. What about cardio? Back in the, in the day when you were training. Oh, I always did cardio. Even when I was at two, 235, at my biggest with abs, I always did cardio. A lot of people think cardio is you're gonna drop size and this yeah. and that, Bullshit. that's not true. Cardio is gonna get your metabolism going, okay? So you absorb your food better, yeah. 
and by keeping your metabolism going, it's going to put on lean muscle and not get fat. You did it uh, early in the morning after you wake up? I, I did it, well, I did it three, four days a week, maybe 30 minutes right after my workout. Yeah. But when I was training for a show, and as I got close to the show, yeah, I did it in the morning at night. So you did cardio to burn, to burn fat or to stay in a good heart shape and Both. for metabolism? All of it. Both. All of it. All of it. All three. What about having H, uh, high intensity interval training versus steady state? What's better that works for I you? I like them both, but I like the steady, consistent, because... That preserves more muscle? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I believe that it, you're going to preserve more muscle and you're just getting to the point where I always tell my guys, they're like, well, what my heart rate should be, what it is and that. Yeah. And, and I'd say, look, keep it to where you're sweating but not over huffing and puffing because now you're working your heart not your cardio you're not burning fat you're just strengthening your uh, you're always going to burn fat because anytime you 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 go at that intensity you're going to burn calorie you know as you burn calorie you're going to reduce fat so no matter what level you're going to go at you're but, still going to burn fat but when it switches to almost burning muscle so when you go super 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 hard then now you're taking a chance of burning muscle. You're not in a, uh, an aerobic state? Yeah, so you want to be at the level, like I said, the best way to explain it is where you're not over huffing and puffing, but you're still consistently heating up and sweating. Yeah. You know? That's the best time because then you keep your muscle preserved and your metabolism is going. So uh, you're able to basically uh, still get tighter and absorb your food better. And at the same time, you know, um, you're not going to burn any muscle. Let's go through some myths about uh, fitness and bodybuilding. So after a workout, there's a window, anabolic window. True or no? I, I believe it. I believe it. Like, like what I do with my guys is, for the most part, now, some people will say, wait until your body is settled with the yeah. blood before you start absorbing the food, then your body absorbs it better. But... To me, I think when you at a level where your body is, you're burning the most glycogen. Yes. Is when your body is gonna want to absorb the most, most. at this time. To so replenish. that's my theory. Or, you know, not everybody agreed to that, but it's always worked for me. And for your and, clients. And so my clients, and then what I do is I, I I have them do. I normally try to get a protein shake right away, um, because it's liquid form. It gets right to your muscle. Mm -hmm. Goes straight to work with amino acid that is, you know, and glutamine for recovery. Okay, and then he goes. And then 30 minutes later, then I have them eat their meal. Meal with the carbs, fats, and uh, protein? Not always. Not always? Yeah. Just I carbs? Mean, uh, um, normally I'll have them get their carbs and their protein. Um, and then like if they're bulking up in the off season, I might have them throw some fat in there too. But to me, I think their body, carbs are going to be better for the muscle for the glycogen especially yeah. for bodybuilders um if you're not if you're trying to drop body fat then i tell them don't do the, the carb do yeah. the fat yeah so another myth uh, the same anabolic window is in the morning right after you work out well, after you wake up when you wake up it, they study shows your gh level is the highest, highest you know and so because of that um you know, a lot of people, they like doing fasted cardio because the fact that there's no food in their system, it goes straight into the fat burning for fat. You know, they burn the fat that actually they, they have in their body versus the carbs in their system first, yeah. you know. Um, and going yes, with carbs. But then again, like if you're talking about anabolic window, some people, when they work out first thing in the morning, they have no pump, right? Because mm -hmm. they, don't, they don't have the food in their system. Yeah. Um, it takes a while to get used to because I used to work out at 4 a.m. in the morning back in my day. Wow. And that first when I started, I had no pump, got shitty workout. Yeah. But when I got used to it, I loved it, you know. But I still got a million before I started my workout, you know. Um, but a lot of my athletes, they like training in the evening time because they got food in them all day. Yes. So now suddenly now they get they a crazy energy. pump. Yeah, and energy. So to me... I think it's whatever your lifestyle, you know, allows you to do. And when you wake up, you got your GH levels very high, and when you take carbs, you kind of lower the GH. 
Um, when you take food in general. In general, yeah, protein yeah. as well. So like a lot of my guys that still try to burn fat and they get on the faster cardio, I have them drink some amino and some glutamine so the muscle doesn't break down yeah. and then they just burn fat. At the same time, simultaneously, can you build muscle and burn fat? Yeah. Some, some kind of transform? Yeah. yeah. But you how can. does it work? Because if you want to build muscle, you, you need what? You need protein and you need carbs to shock the system, to have energy, to break the you muscle You don't down. always need carbs. If you, if you are still trying to drop a lot of fat, but you still want to put on muscle, first thing in the morning, if you can get away with just protein and, and, and your aminos and your glutamine um, and just go work out, that's all you need because you got your protein for muscle building. Carbs is going to help, obviously, give you that crazy pump and the blood flow and everything else. Yeah. But you're going to get it throughout the day anyway. You know, so it just depends if you have more body fat to drop. If a lot of my guys have body fat to drop, I just have them do protein and if they're going to work out in the morning. So, for, for instance, if there is a guy or gal which is overweight, for instance, 200 pounds, a girl. So at first place, she would have to lose fat and then build muscle. You can do both. You can do it simultaneously. Yeah. You can kind of transform. That, 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 that's a myth. People yeah. used to always say you can't do fat burning and building muscle at the same time. If that's the case, how's the bodybuilder stay so huge? Well, once again, they do steroids. That's, so. that's, but see, a lot of people always think if they do steroids, they're going to look like that. It's not the case. It's because the way they eat and the way they push themselves and the consistency of what they do. Yeah, Steroid is just, like I said, it's just an icing. But they yeah. can consume almost twice as protein uh, if you do stuff. Not no? true. Not true? Not true. I take digestive enzymes every meal when I was competing oh, because it, helps. it helped break my food down. Mm -hmm. Or else it just sits there. When I'm on my next meal, my meal is just still sitting there. But if, you know, that's the secret, guys. Do the papaya enzymes with every meal. Now, suddenly now, when you're on your second meal, your body's already breaking it down. Isn't that the case if you take additional enzymes, your body isn't used to produce their own? No, not true. Because the two things that I always recommend is for their gut is probiotic and digestive enzymes. Probiotic is going to keep your good gut, right? Yeah. Your good waste. That's the best way to explain it and get rid of your bad waste, right? And then digestive enzymes can help break that food down. So instead of sitting there and not knowing where to go, it's going to stream it where it's supposed to go. So your body's going to absorb it a lot better. So probiotics is a food for bacteria that is in our mm -hmm. gut. Yeah. So I've been listening to this guy, uh, Dr. Stephen Gundry. Yeah. Have yeah, you? Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And he was saying that uh, our hu let's he says that take your body as an as for instance as a spaceship for bacteria. If your bacteria is happy, you're gonna get good mood. You're gonna be happy and etc. Yeah. You have to feed your bacteria, which is four kilos, I believe, total weight in our body. You have to feed the bacteria right. You will get good shape, good mood, hormones, all this stuff. Everything it tells what you put into your body, and that's gonna your mood, your energy, your clarity, everything. You know what I mean? Because if you eat like shit, you go eat McDonald's every single day, right? Um, you're gonna feel like crap, right? And that's partly because you kill the the good bacteria. And there is then uh, there is a mess in your gut Be because your body is getting nasty fat. Okay, Trans it's fats. getting it's getting food that's just so. The best way to explain it, like Jack Elaine puts it best, and I still remember it. it even uh, me as a kid, he says that man makes it, don't eat it. So you want to stick to all whole food. Yeah, because he's uh, absolutely right. You know, if man makes it, all suddenly now you're clouding your whole system, right? But if you're eating good, clean food into your body, your body's going to basically absorb those better, right? It's not going to sit there. It's kind of like taking a sponge and you're trying to filter everything through your, 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 everything through your body. And then if you're eating crap, it's not going to go in, right? Yeah. But if you have everything that's super thin, super easy to absorb, it's going to go into your system. So your body works the exact same way, you know? Right. So the, the thing that I can only, I'm only uh, used to in, in the U.S. is that I have to buy organic. Yeah. Because I've been told that when you come to the U.S., if you go, for instance, for vegetables, for meat, fruits, berries, not organic, that's not good. 
Because in Europe there are other standards. Yeah, in, in, in Europe and, you know, France and, you know, Russia and all these places, all these other places, they eat, they, they don't, all their food doesn't have all the, the crazy stuff that's in there, you know. Um, it's just all natural food. Over here, they, they process everything. Why do you think that is? Because people like... It's cheaper. Cheaper? You mean the food is cheaper for people? Or yeah. it's cheaper just to produce and to sell more? Well, you got to remember, um, when they do that, it preserves it, right? They yeah. pesticide their food and stuff like that, right? Or else it gets bug and all yeah, kinds of stuff, it, right? Yeah. So they're going to try to figure a way to preserve their food the longest. So that way it holds more shelf life, right? And I mean, they, 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 they did a test on a McDonald um, on their burger and they burnt it, right? Burnt it, everything, right? It still wasn't, it still was okay. And you know, all the crap that's been in there, right? So the, the thing about it is like, you know, people look for a fast way and an easy way. Yeah. And so because of that, you know, that's the reason why there's so much crap out there. So Chris, let's get back to you. Okay. Uh, in, uh, I want to say that I don't want to look like an asshole of asking these questions. Just I would well, ask. Well, no, because the, the 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 I understand. I mean, the public wants to know, and you know, so it's your job to ask yeah, the questions. Yeah, and I'm just uh, generally curious. I have never had a person which is in a wheelchair. Yeah. So the questions I'm going to ask uh, next don't don't think that I'm an asshole. I'm just curious. Yeah. How do you say you're? You're disabled, you're handicapped, how, how is it called? Paraplegic. Paraplegic? Yeah. What's the most difficult thing for you to do right now? I drive a car. Uh, I drive. You drive. You got some I drive. special Hand tips. control, yeah. Hand control. Mm -hmm. How do you get in the car? Um, I pull myself up. <laughs> so what I do is I, uh, thank God I have the upper body strength. Yeah, So I we get, can see that. I lift myself up, I get into the car, and then after I get into the car, uh, I break my wheelchair down and I put it in myself and then I, I drive off. If my wife is with me, then she puts the wheelchair in the back for me. That way I don't have to break it. And there are some special cars when you can get from, uh, from the rear with, with, the, with the chair, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So those people, they got um, uh, electric, you know, they got an electric chair. Yeah. And they drive right in and they can drive right to the, where they're sitting and then they don't have the seat there so they sit in their chair or they transfer into the chair so you you buy a regular car then you go to some kind of a guy that there's two types things? there's a one that you get it installed or the one i have is uh you know it's just a cheap one where we can unclamp the two at the bottom right and then take the strap off and then my wife can drive. So, so I, I did that purposely because then she doesn't have to try to drive with the hand control, you know. How does it look like this hand control? It, it's just what it is, is like, you know, it's, it's one side, you're holding right here, right? The steering wheel. Yeah. If you go this way, right? You push down, you're gonna push on the, the brake. Yeah. If you lift up, it pushes on the gas. Oh, I got you. So it's just back and forth. So push down and lift up. That's it. How long did it, did it took you to... You know, get well, with the, I have the craziest story with that. <clears throat> so what happened was um, I was at home when I had my spinal cord injury and I was relying on people for ride. And then I just like didn't want to depend on people anymore. I went on Amazon, ordered the hand control, put it in myself and then basically uh, start driving around the neighborhood. You know, and, and uh, when you have a spinal cord injury, they take your license away because you know you can't use your leg anymore and so i drove for the first two years with no license you know and but what i did was i started driving around the neighborhood and i remember my younger son was in the car with me he says you know please don't let my dad crash you know and um i start getting brave enough to slowly drive around the neighborhood then i started getting on the slow lane on the freeway then fast lane and then now i drive better than my wife she'll tell me you know and you have a driving license. Yeah, you can yeah. get one. Yeah, I went back and so after two years of driving without my license, I got pulled over, and it wasn't even for uh, my license. It was oh. a, the, for no front license plate, right? And so uh, 
I gave him my license. He didn't even say anything, even though it was suspended. Yeah. You know, he didn't say nothing about my license. So I said, you know what? That that was a sign for me to go get my license now. <laughs> so they take your license or uh, driver license once you get this. Uh... Yeah, they they suspend your license. Or or they just don't extend it. No, they they just they suspend, just take it. suspend your license. And then so I went back after two years, I went back and retake the test, you know, and then I had to take the driving test and the written test again. And um, that's how I got my license back. What about the wheelchairs? There are, what are the options right now? So yours is mechanical, you do with, with yep. your hands. Yep. There are some electric with, yep. with the batteries. Yep. 2023, maybe some technology, what's the, the Rolls Royce of the chairs? So mine's custom to me. Like I went in, I got fitted, the length of it, because if you notice, it's not very big. Yeah. So a lot of people have a big chair. Yeah. Um, I got everything custom for me, you know. Um, so, but they have the just a regular chair, but this one is about 14 pounds, 15 pounds. It's so light. Yeah. So, you know, but I take the wheels off and then I throw it in my car myself, yeah. you know. Why didn't you go with the, with the electric one? Because then I can't drive myself because I, how would I put the chair in my car? It's too heavy. Yeah, I wouldn't be able to lift it up, you know. Um, I would have to get the electrical ramp and get a, tr a van and God forbid, I don't want to drive a van, man. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. You yeah. got the nice car. That's your car? Yeah, yeah. You got the nice car. <laughs> what's, uh, what's difficult being in a chair? Um, what's difficult that, that is... That regular people don't even yeah, think they, about. Yeah, they're like, okay, like, like my wife never complains about anything. She cleans the house. She does everything. She helps, you know, like taking the grocery in. She, she knows like when we're traveling, she's got more luggage she's got to carry because yeah. of me being in my situation. So those are the things we take for granted. It's not being able to like, you know, pick up these things and walk with it and do everything, you know. So that's the... Now, can I do it? Yes but it would be a lot more challenging for me than yeah, my wife sure. to be able to just push it and go right so that that's the thing that we take for granted is um doing those those simple those house chores mm -hmm. and you know um you know taking the grocery in and you know traveling and stuff like that you know how about the infrastructure is it okay for uh for the people with, with, with wheelchairs for instance uh stores shopping malls uh, Well, you do have a car. So, for instance, if a person doesn't have a car, they can uh, they can bus, get they can uh, they can actually get picked up at the house and get dropped off. You know, at any place, any, yes, anytime, any place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the state does that. The state does that. Amazing. Yeah, this, this but to amazing. me, I, I I remember having to go into for Dallas's, and you know they would um, I would see people waiting, and I would you know, and they're waiting sometimes for hours to get picked up. You know, and here I am getting in my car and just driving off, you know. So you're talking about gratitude again. Yeah. You look at that, I'm like, man, thank God that I'm able to just get in my car and go. I don't have to wait for people, you know. Chris, how long did it take you to realize you're in the chair and uh, you have to change your life? A year, half a year, two years, more or less? I would say about two to three years, all said and done, until I realized, you know, hey, I got to adapt to everything. So was that hard mentally? Yeah. Yeah, the mental aspect of it is 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 a lot more harder, you know, than the physical aspect of it. And when I see people doing legs and I can't do legs, it would really used to bother me. Or the hardest thing is when my legs started atrophying and you go from a bodybuilding legs and your legs are like this and you watch it shrink and you know Like in the middle of like you just see it shrink like you know in the middle of your eyes you just watch it you know and that was very very hard to deal with I mean I didn't even want to look at my legs from the beginning because when it started atrophying you know and that's why like all my athletes would tell you my leg workouts is the most crucial because mm -hmm. I have a leg passion because I can't train legs so I, I really push them hard you know mm -hmm. What about any recommendations, maybe some, some, some words for the people that watch this and maybe they got into this situation just like you do and they're new to it, a month, maybe two, three months, and maybe they're in the dark place. Yeah. 
any suggestions, any, anything for them? Find a really good support team. Find someone that's going to encourage you and push you and be there for you and help you get through it because it's going to be very hard. You're going to have your high moment and your low moment. Some day you're going to feel great. Other day you feel like shit. Um, like I said, um, I break down probably once a month, once every other month, you know. And um, we're all human beings. We all go through it. But if you find a good support team to help you and be, keep yourself busy. Because when you have too much time on your hand, the enemy starts getting a hold of your brain. So I always say the enemy doesn't know what to do if you just don't quit. You keep yourself busy all the time, okay? That goes for everything in life. Um, whatever you're going through, you can get through it. But the biggest thing is keep yourself busy. Look at, YouTube will be a best friend. The reason why is because anything that you want to find, it's on YouTube. So when I was going through it from the beginning, I had stuff constantly in my ear, motivational stuff, stuff that's going to help me all the time. I never wanted me to think because if I allow myself to think, then it's going to be not the best. So I put stuff in my ear and I remember when they, when I had my spinal cord injury, they sent me to a place um, about 45 an hour from here and they just to learn to, for therapy, just to learn how to transfer from the wheelchair to the toilet to the bed to all the basic thing we take for granted and the nurse would come in every time and she goes what are you listening to mm -hmm. she goes you, you always have things in your ear and i knew i couldn't allow myself to think at the time i had stuff in my ear that was going to pump me up that's going to keep me motivated that's going to keep me focused that's going to keep me happy Whatever you want is on YouTube, you know. Listen to a lot of audiobook because you need to listen to things that's going to help you. Oh, I'm stressed out. Let's find things on YouTube that's going to help you with stress. I'm healing. Find things on YouTube that's going to help you heal. Everything is on there, you yeah. know. And a lot of people, I don't think they use it enough. You know, even, even to today, I still listen to motivational stuff. I don't even listen to music when I'm working out. Mm -hmm. I listen to motivational stuff. They keep me going. Yeah. What's the worst kind of the worst thing that regular people who can walk do to a person who can't walk? For instance, they feel compassion. They feel too much compassion. They're always trying to help and say, oh, you're poor. You Let know me. what? I, I hate to say it. They can't figure me out because I don't look like the normal person in the wheelchair. Yeah. They look at me and they're like, hey, this guy looks like he works out. <laughs> but why is he in the chair? What's going on with him? So they try to figure me out. But a lot of time, I think the biggest thing is, believe it or not, because they, when you walk past them, nine out of ten times, they don't look at you. The reason why they don't look at you is because they don't want to make you feel awkward. Yeah. But they actually make you feel worse. They don't even realize that. Because, you know, when someone's in a wheelchair and they're walking by, they're just like, they don't look instead of like, okay. hey, how are you doing, you know? And, and, and so to me, I don't have that problem because the energy that I put out, but most people that's in a wheelchair, they just kind of like not pay attention to them, you know? And to me, not looking at them like that to me is actually, it's actually rude. Actually rude, even yeah. rude. Yeah. So once again, I'm not being, just asking not, not because I'm an asshole. So you're, you want to be a normal person. It doesn't mean, well, that the fact that you can walk doesn't mean that you're not a normal person. Yeah, I, I, you don't need any help if you don't ask any no, additional help. Let no. me help you with the groceries. Let me help but, you But if they you. do, I thank them. I'm not the type of person like, oh, I don't need your help. Yeah. You know what I mean? To me, I'll take the help. Just like when we're going around, my wife pushes me. It's great because it saves my shoulder. Because yeah. when I keep doing this, it, it messes up my rotator cuff, yeah. you know? So um, when I'm with her, she pushes me around. I, pff, hey, more power, you know what I mean? Yeah. Because it helps me out. So, um, and someone opens up the door, hey, thank you, you know what I mean? That's just my personality. So I don't, I'm not that person like, I don't need your help. Or, yeah. I don't this, I don't that, you know, or get mad or something. Mm -hmm. To me, I just look at it, I'm just, I'm thankful, you know, that you open up the door for me, you know? So you told me that uh, once you get into a wheelchair, you get kind, some kind of a course when you, they teach you how to get into the chair, out of the chair, to the toilet, and etc. Do you have some kind of a group of people that are in the same position, just like you, when you can 
gather and talk about it, to speak up or something like this? I, I, I don't, um, just because I kind of learned how to deal with it. I really, even from the beginning, I didn't. Mm -hmm. But when I went into the, um, the, uh, the rehab, yeah. they didn't teach me how to get in and out of my car. I had to learn that on my own. They just taught me how to like transfer from the toilet to the bed, you know, all the basic things. But as far as like, um, you know, driving, I had to learn that on my own. I had to learn how to put the wheelchair on my own. Uh, you know, um, it was just like, to me as like, I always believe that there's a will, there's a way. And so my wife will tell you, she met me when I'm already in a chair. And so um, she knows that I don't need her. I want her, there's a difference. You know, so, yeah. and, and she knows, you know, um, I always told her, look, I don't need you. You know, I can do everything myself, you know, but I want you. There's a different, you know, so. That's the, yeah, I don't need you. I want you. I'm with you, not because I have to, but yeah. because you want to. Yeah, yeah. And, and so, you know, a lot of people, they, they depend on people. I don't, but it is a blessing to have her to help, you know to help put the wheelchair in the back yeah. or to push me. I don't take those things for granted, you know? Um, but yeah, so she, I used to train a lot of bikini girls back in the day and I was already in the wheelchair. And I told myself I'll never date any of my clients ever. Why? Um, just cause I, I always wanted to keep it professional because I didn't want to lose a client mm. just in case anything ever happened. You know, you go out together and you, it doesn't work out. So now you just lost a client. Yeah. So, but, my wife, I broke my rule, you know? So it just, it just kind of happened on its own. It wasn't like I was looking, she wasn't looking, and we were just friends, and she couldn't figure me out because, you know, she gets hit on guys all the time, but I would it was like, she goes, what's wrong with this guy? <laughs> like, you know, can't figure me out. But I, I just has always been like that, very professional. If, if I'm work, it's work, you know, that's it, you know, so. You know. So Chris, what do you do now? You train people for the I, I train people online, yeah. Yeah, so a lot of my clients online, if they're closer, I might get them in there one, one day a week to train with me. Only you know? pro or? Uh... Opponent, amateur, everybody, you know. And so so the, the people that I work with is mainly they, they either get ready for a contest or off season, or they just want to get jacked. They just want to look like they work out as far as a bodybuilder, but not compete. And was there so, for some overweight people contact? Overweight you? people, I have referral to that because I have a lot of my, my coaches. And then one guy's really, really good. He's one of my client, uh, but he does nothing but overweight. So, so then, your passion is pro. You like my passion like is contests and guys who's already worked out, but they just haven't figured out how to really get their body to that tune that they want. You know. I got you. Yeah. What are the plans, Chris? The plans with the health, with the, with your career. So, like we life? own, we own. Uh, it's called Total Scoping. We own two two businesses, my wife and I, and so that's a health and a wellness. And it's uh, it's called CryoSkin, and it's fat freeze. So you freeze the fat and you pee and poop it up. It's uh, one less invasive than your liposuction. Wow, it, it, it's great. So we, we that's our main business, but yeah. we have like an oxygen bar, we have like a fitness cocoon, we have a, <laughs> a infrared sauna, um, you know, all the different things. But our main business is the the CryoSkin. Yeah. Um, so. Um, we we just opened up our second location with that but my wife runs that and then we put our head together as far as growing it yeah and i focus on the online coaching i'm um, gonna put all the links below guys yeah yeah and what about your health uh, with the dialysis everything's good i mean i i that's why like eating has to be so so on point for me because it'll affect my dialysis number you know yeah so um i really really try to watch what i eat you know um like I said, Dallas is just part of the, part of the process, you know? Um, I'm not gonna sit here and bitch and complain and moan about it, I just need to deal with it. Like I said, it takes out one third of my day, so the other two thirds of my day, I have to make it count. And you go five days a week or seven days a week? I do it at home. You do it at home? Yeah. It's convenient. Yeah, yeah. we, we uh, learned how to do it, so we went to the center yeah. for six weeks, um, almost six weeks, and we learned how to do everything, but it was, it was hard, man, because, that machine is so sensitive. If anything is off, it will, will not let you move ahead. So we had to learn so many steps. And then at one point, my wife didn't think we we're gonna be able to do it. 
Mm. She was stressed out. She goes, it's not cut out for me. It's not cut out for me. I can't do this. I'm forgetting everything. And, but we, we have it down now, you know, obviously. Um, but it, it's more convenient because I can get up and sit on my recliner. And that's the only thing that sucks about Dallas is because it's uh, four or five hours a day. And you have your arms out the whole time. Yeah. And you cannot move it in that whole time when you're on the recliner. I got you. So that, that has to stay there because you have two 15 gauge needles. I saw it on, on Instagram. And so uh, if I move, it'll poke me. Do you feel fatigued afterwards? You know, I have my days. Someday, yes. Someday, no. But uh, when I was doing it three days a week, the, the machine that they were using, I had no energy for nothing. Mm. But the home name note that I do at home now, it doesn't pull out as much because it's five days. It's more often. Yeah. So that's the toss. Toss uh, is that the three days a week they pull more out, but the problem was is they pull out more, so I'm more drained. Yeah. But with this one, I'm doing it five days, so they don't pull as much, and so therefore I'm not so tired. Like I felt like an old man before when I was doing the three days a week. Wow. So. Is there any technology, medicine, some specialist you know, in Japan, somewhere there, that could help you getting, get better? Well, I, my buddy owns a stem cell place that when, when Ronnie went to, down yeah. in uh, Mexico, Puerto Vallarta. I've been meaning to get over there, I just haven't had a chance to get down there. But I want to do the stem cells and see if it can regenerate my cells, so that way, you know, um, I can... Um, see if that helps and uh, with my kidney so i've heard the stem cells do miracles yeah yeah so i have to get over there but the only thing is is once i start i have to be going there um every uh six to eight weeks to keep up with it because it doesn't work one time you know? and they do it in mexico because in the u.s it's not legal right it's not so the embryonic is not legal in 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 the US they call it stem cells but what they're doing is they're taking your bone they're going through your bone marrow yeah and they're pulling it out and then they're spinning it and the top part is stem cells yes and they shoot it back to you where the in Mexico they do the embryonic they take the first birth and then they take that umbilical cord and they test the stem cells and they regrow it so they they take the first uh, birth, birth uh, of the uh, umbilical cord. Uh, wow! So um, it's it's the embryonic. It's the one that basically I I believe is the most potent. You know, is it um, expensive? Yeah, but it's not. What like Panama was the first one of the first yes. place, and a lot of people are doing it there, and they're spending forty five to sixty thousand dollar per course. Yes. And how many do you need? Um, they would stay there the whole time and then, you know, for two, two weeks, you know, and then 60,000 where, uh, my friend in Mexico, he, um, he really takes care of, uh, even like when Ronnie went down there, like you can get it done in Mexico for about 12, 15,000, where if you went to, um, Panama, it'll cost you about 60 grand. Wow. So it's four times. yeah, yeah. It's just a name. It's all it is. And, you know, my buddy, he does a great job, you know, uh, it's called uh, uh, Regenerating, Regenerate um, Recovery down there in Mexico, named Dan, Danny. So, Chris, there's always a final question in my podcast that I do. Let's have two assumptions. Assumption number one is uh, the most powerful uh, man on, on the planet Earth is the president of the United States. And the second assumption is you become one. So once you become the president of the U.S., the Secret Service comes at you and say, Hello, Mr. President, we know all, all the answers, we're on your side, we know the truth. What would be your first question? And you will get an answer to. That's a hard question. There's so much, uh, <laughs> there's so much that goes into it. So the first questions, are you saying the first questions that I'm going to ask the Secret Service? Or? Yeah, and they will tell you the truth. You can ask everything about the aliens, about God, about everything. Oh, what would I want to know? Yeah, what do you want to know? I want to know. I don't want to know about the alien. That's what I want to know. Because I see a lot of things and it, you know, and they're hiding a lot of stuff. But obviously there's pictures and stuff like that from the past that shows the alien. Eight yeah. out of ten say aliens. Really? Same really? thing? Yes. They want to know. And I'm always asking, like, would your life change? Uh, not that much. I would just know that there are aliens or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, because you want to know. 
you know, you want to know what's going on um, in this world and if it's really true, you know. So, Chris, about 10 years ago, you gave me so, so much hope. And I was living with that hope for a few years just because I was following you on Facebook. Just because of your constant posts, I believe you were almost every day saying this, I'm going to walk again, I'm going to walk again. Yeah, yeah. And I was reading the, those posts from 2000, I believe, maybe 12, maybe 13, more than a year. And uh, when this thing happened with my mom, I was like right away. My mom is gonna get well. My mom is gonna get well. I even did a t-shirt and I was wearing the, this proudly. I wanna thank you for that hope because just like you mentioned in the beginning of the podcast, the hope is, sometimes the hope is everything we were left with. So this hope is very much needed, was needed for me. And I believe the, the hope is very, very much needed for the persons that are watching this podcast right now. Because once again, as, just as you mentioned, everybody struggles, everybody has problems. Some are big, some are, some are small, some are big only for this person and etc. I just want to thank you for your, um, for your desire to live, for your motivation, for your mentality. And the, the message that you wrote me when I asked you whether you'll be fatigued or no or not after the uh, dialysis, you wrote me, no, bro, I'm a, I'm a beast. <laughs> and that moment, I knew that you're, you're damn fine. I appreciate, I appreciate everything. No, I appreciate you driving up here, spending six hours, especially with your family. And, and you know, that's 12, you know, to, to, to 14 hours just driving, you know. It was a pleasure. I, I appreciate you you're doing that. So I knew when you did that, I knew you were serious. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah, 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 of course.